just to give a short intro for our next speaker, uh, the next presentation is on uh, Claridge's Hotel five-story iceberg basement, um, and it's by Michelle Mackey, who's a project engineer at uh, McGee Group. Uh, Michelle is a civil engineer who has chosen a site-based career over that in the design office. Um, she spent the last 13 years in the employment of specialist London-based contractor McGee Group. Uh, during her tenure here, she's worked on several notable projects, including King's Cross Station redevelopment, the, Sca the Scapel and the AELTCCT Wimbledon Tennis Court courts, and is currently project engineer for McGee on their design and build contract to construct a five-story basement below the world-renowned five-star Claridge's Hotel in London's Mayfair, whilst ensuring the hotel remains fully operational throughout the works, which is no easy feat. So, uh, just thanks very much, Michelle. Uh, thank you, and uh, thank you for inviting me here today. Um, so this presentation is going to go through the um, construction and sequence methodology that would enable us to put in um, five levels of basement below the, uh, the hotel. Um, I'll start by giving you a bit of background uh, into Claridge's itself. Um, Claridge's is a well-renowned um, and considered one of the best, most iconic hotels in the world. Um, has a clientele that boasts Hollywood A-listers, rock stars, um, and royalty. Um, it's, there's been a site, uh, or the hotel on this site, uh, since the early 1800s, um, which was started by the Claridge family. Um, but it wasn't until the 1890s when it was refurbished into the red brick um, Victorian building um, that we recognize today. The construction of the Victorian uh, part of the building was typical of the time um, with load-bearing masonry walls on corbelled footings, um, thin concrete jackarts floors with corrugated permanent formwork sheeting. Um, but the um, 1920s Art Deco extension um, was built um, using different construction, um, which added an extra 80 rooms to the hotel and a ballroom. This was an early example of um, the uh, of a steel frame construction and, um, and raft uh, slab construction, reinforced concrete raft slab construction. Um, and it's the difference in these two um, types of construction um, which would become significant when considering the type of basement um, or how the basement was going to be formed underneath the hotel. The hotel um, was acquired in um, 2004 um, by a team of investors, um, along with two other hotels, the Barclay and the Connaught, um, by, um, and most notably, um, Paddy McKillen. Um, it was during this time that um, he invited a number of engineers and contractors to, um, to consult with him about um, extending the basement below the ground floor. His brief was very, very clear. Um, initially, he wanted two levels of basement um, to be but critically, the hotel was to remain open throughout this construction process. Um, the, um, the hotel could compete um, with its reputation and, um, and its service as to be one of the best in the world, but it didn't quite have some of the modern facilities that some of the other hotels had. And this development was seen as a way of um, upgrading it to bring it into uh, the 21st century. Um, the costly decision to keep the hotel open um, during the project was driven by the client's own research um, who had discovered that um, other hotels, when they had undergone these refurbishments, um, when they reopened, it took them a while until they reached the same level of occupancy that they had prior to the refurbishment and lost some of their very loyal clientele in the process, um, which was not something the... Um, the client was prepared to negotiate on. A lot of the engineers um, who, who were consulting at the time came up with, um, with schemes that didn't meet this criteria. Um, um, they wanted to come in through the, through the main foyer of the hotel and, and do something through the rough slab. So it wasn't, it wasn't something that, was, that the client uh, wanted to do. It was during this process that McGee Group were invited um, to pre-qualify um, for tender. Um, McGee's um, were the only ones who were prepared to commit to, to the challenge to the, to the, the client design brief. 
Um, McGee's had, um, had quite a high profile portfolio um, with um, projects such as Wembley Stadium, Wimbledon Tennis Courts and King's Cross Station. Um, it also, whilst it was known predominantly for demolition, it also specialised in complex facade retentions and deep basements. Um, but these tended to be uh, blue sky type uh, construction. Uh, such as this one here at Leicester Square, um, a traditional uh, basement construction with earth retaining wall and, um, and propping. Um, logistically very difficult because of where it was situated, but um, had the advantage that you could use tower cranes and uh, you had uh, blue sky above you. Um, we also uh, weren't, uh, it was, we weren't um, strangers to doing uh, uh, basements underneath existing hotels, such as this one here at Falcon House. Um, but the difference was that it was under, um, it was unoccupied. And um, what Paddy McKillen was proposing was something very, very different. Um, but the project itself got shelved at this point um, due to a well-publicised legal battle on um, hotel ownership and wasn't... Um, didn't resurface again until 2015 when McGee's were um, brought in to negotiate a design and build contract. Um, back in 2007, the, um, there was a number of preliminary investigations in the form of trial pits um, and um, uh, opening up works, SI reports. And um, these were able to um, indicate that the, um, that the building was made up of 61 steel columns um, in the Art Deco wing, um, which we would be going under, which you see here, um, and that it, um, uh, it was on a reinforced concrete raft, unlike the Victorian building, which was assumed to be on um, strip footings. Did emerge that it was on a raft foundation um, itself, but the concrete was very poor and it wasn't reinforced and not suitable for the kind of construction that we were proposing. Um, the concrete in the um, Art Deco wing um, was very good and it was good quality construction. Um, so there was a lot of confidence at this stage, but the SI report didn't glean the same kind of confidence, which showed that the um, uh, the geological strata um, beneath the hotel was London clay but overlaid with gravel um, but then overlaid with a silty sandy clay and it was this material that was somewhat of a showstopper um, because in its contained state whilst very um, whilst had a very high bearing capacity as soon as it was disturbed um, it would run like water um, and could um, undermine the foundations. Um, it was found that when this, um, this material was dried out, it was actually very stable and it, um, and it had properties similar to clay, uh, but when there was water in it, and it did have a very high water content, it was like toothpaste and would just, be, would just squeeze out of the, uh, underneath the foundation. Um, many experts were brought in to consult on this material, um, suggesting things like grout injection and uh, ground freezing. But the grout injection um, wasn't suitable. Um, the material was too clay-like to inject, and freezing wasn't an option because of the damage that that would cause to the hotel. Um, WJ Groundwater came in and suggested that um, we could install a series of wells and, um, and extract the water from the ground using a vacuum dewatering pump. Um, but in able to do this, um, it relied on the ground not being recharged with water. So forming a water cutoff to the site perimeter um, became the primary objective into seeing whether this um, project was even viable. In 2015, then, McGee's were on board and we recommenced our site investigation works. Um, we had a little bit of luck um, with the layout of the site. Over on the western elevation, there was a series of um, sh Larson sheet piles that had been installed to enable the Art Deco raft construction to be, um, to be constructed in the 1920s. Um, this gave a good water cutoff um, all along this boundary. Um, over on the east side, for one half of the site, there was um, some underpinning to the building next door 
again to aid the raft construction. Um, this was formed into the London clay, so gave a reasonable water cutoff. Um, on the other half of the site, um, there was a sequent piled wall um, as part of a 1980s development of the building next door, which had a, a shallow basement. This was an excellent water cutoff along this boundary. So this left us with two challenges um, to the north and south um, of the site. Um, along the south facade, um, we were able to um, install a secant piled wall. The road here on Brooks Mews was, um, was a more of a service road and um, not a through road. And we were granted permission by Westminster City Council um, to close the pavement and, um, and install a secant piled wall here um, along the edge of the raft. The raft actually extended 2.4 metres beyond the line of the facade wall. Um, and installing the secant piled wall um, was, gave us two advantages. Um, a, we could, um, it formed the water cutoff that we were after, and uh, B, it would enable um, us to dig down to the B1 level with it as a earth retaining structure. Um, over on the north side of the site along Brook Street, it was a different story. Um, the road here was very busy, um, and Westminster Council were not going to, to grant a pavement closure. Not only that, um, where we would want to carry out similar works would be beside the ballroom entrance, um, which would host very high profile events. And the client wasn't keen on us opening up the ground um, with all the disturbance that involved um, along here. So the solution that was proposed um, became known as the uh, water cutoff beam. Um, WJ groundwater were brought in. Um, we injected the gravels um, to stabilize those and put in a series of vacuum dewatering wells um, along what would be the water cutoff beam. Um, it was situated in uh, underneath the pavement bolts, which um, were again beyond the raft slab and the facade line. And the hotel occupied three of these um, vaults and the other two were, um, were inaccessible and housed the substation. But in the three vaults, um, uh, on two of the three vaults, we were able to sink um, a shaft um, that we then excavated a heading along the edge of the raft, um, the width of the building, 25 metres long, um, and, uh, and the ground now, with the aid of the dewatering pumps, was, um, was very hard. Previously, you would have been able to bail it out with a bucket, whereas now you are having to use pneumatic clay spades. Uh, once this was excavated along the length of the heading, it was filled with uh, fi <coughs> fixed reinforcement and filled it with concrete, um, the concrete being pumped from Brooks Mews end of the site through the hotel on a quiet Saturday morning. Um, running through the corridors, the pump line was over 50 meters long. Um, the concrete needed to be self-compacting and able to flow um, over 12 meters because we only had the two access shafts um, at, uh, in each of the, the two vaults to be able to pour the concrete and we weren't able to vibrate it either. Um, this was one of the many logistical challenges of this job, um, but it was, it was very successful. Um, and at that point, we had um, essentially a water cut off to the perimeter of the site. In reality, we still had some water ingress um, because of um, uh, just small gaps between these elements of works, but it was very, uh, very small, and we were essentially left with just the water that remained in the silt. Um, we then proceeded with installing the vacuum dewatering pumps in the one room of the hotel um, that we were allocated. Um, beside that one room, there was a window removed, one window, and, um, and our gantry was erected um, during uh, this time, uh, which would serve um, to service the site um, in terms of its logistics, materials, in and out, muckaway lorries, etc. Um, we also continued um, taking some samples um, of, the, of the raft slab at the time. The concrete was very sound, um, good quality, good strength, but the reinforcement wasn't quite as dense as um, Arabs would have hoped who had been appointed uh, by McGee's at this point as their geotechnical and structural engineers. Um, but one of the design team managed to find an article in, published in Builders Magazine in the late 1920s, which was an article on the construction of the raft being um, an early example of the uh, reinforced concrete raft at the time. And in this article, it stated that there was 70 tons of 
reinforcement in it. And Arabs were able to use this to back analyze, along with information we had from all the trial pits, um, to see that the raft, um, we could justify the raft um, in terms of what we were then going to do uh, to it. So on to what we were going to do, the how, what was our uh, concept design that would enable us to, um, to put five basements in underneath the hotel through one room, one window. Um, we started off by coring the raft slab, um, just two meters square to start off with, that was all that we were allowed at the time. Um, we removed these uh, pieces in bite-sized chunks, removed um, with, a, with a hoist, um, and chain block arrangement um, off-site. And then we proceeded to excavate a uh, shaft, um, an access shaft. Um, this access shaft, um, its purpose was to access a network of tunnels that needed to be installed underneath the hotel. Um, a little bit of a blurry picture, but gives you a sense of, uh, of the, the extensive network that we needed to put in underneath there. Um, each of these tunnels um, was was we had three main access uh, lengths of tunnels, but off these um, were um, shorter tunnels to each of the 61 column locations in the building. Um, these tunnels were formed um, of steel um, frames um, to the column location, um, relatively lightweight that they could be um, manhandled, weighing less than 50 uh, kilograms each piece um, to um, and assembled by the guys on site and bolted together. Um, each frame was 500 mil wide with um, two plates on the side of the, um, of the side trees that were then grouted um, so that the void behind the excavated um, section to allow the frame to be um, installed um, was grouted so that there would be no ground movement um, and settlements into that space. Um, the headings progressed um, 500 mil at a time and um, to, to form the um, to form the tunnels or the headings, and um, when we arrived at a column location, we now had to remove four of the sill beams and therefore disturb the load path that we had put in. Um, the way around this was to install a, uh, a pair of steel trusses um, that would divert the load into the um, outer frames, which would allow us then to remove the um, sill beams and start constructing the first ring and the collar of the um, of the uh, shaft. Um, this collar was made up of reinforcement, um, uh, which was then concreted, capturing the bolts hanging down from the side trees. And therefore, once the concrete has had cured, the load path was restored back into the concrete collar, which then allowed us to proceed with excavating the tunnel um, down to the B5 level. Each one of these steel rings was 1.8 meters diameter. Um, excavating um, approximately three cubic meters uh, per per ring, um, they were they were limited to this size because this was the this was the maximum size that the heading was, and therefore the maximum size that the that the ring could be. Um, this was all that was allowed in terms of opening up the raft um, uh, at each time, um, but they still needed to be big, big enough for two men to work down. Um, what? What we didn't have space for, given that we had two meters of headroom below the raft slab and, um, and only 1.8 meters wide of tunnel, um, was any mechanical plant. So everything was hand dug um, all the way down to the B5 level of the basement. Um, the diameter um, of the caisson at this point was less of a concern and we could enlarge um, the caisson to um, 2.4 diameters and install um, standard concrete segmental linings. But to do this, we needed to excavate and install a steel transition ring that would allow us to go from the 1.8 diameter to the 2.4 diameter and continue with installing the concrete uh, segmental linings. Um, these continued and varied in depth um, depending on the load of the column and the, um, and the level of the clay, which did vary across the site. Um, at the bottom of this, the, um, the shaft was then um, excavated again to form a bell. Um, these varied in size um, as well, depending on the load, uh, largest being 4.6 diameter and 1.8 meters high. The um, timing of the concrete then to fill this was, um, was, was timed um, to match the completion of this and the inspection 
by uh, McGee's and Arabs down at the bottom. This is now 26 metres below where we started. Um, the concrete um, was delivered and we filled up to the underside of the B5 level slab, or what would be the B5 level slab. Concrete was, um, was brought in in lorries that was discharged in a pump um, at our gantry level and then pumped to each of the 61 locations um, into a hopper and then uh, dropped with a tremie pipe um, to the underside um, of the B5 level. Um, the level was controlled using a laser distance meter at the top because no one could go down the shaft, obviously, at this stage. Um, the concrete was uh, C35 concrete um, and took approximately 35 cubic metres to fill it to um, the underside of the B5 level. The top um, piece of concrete um, was self-compacting concrete to give us a nice smooth surface to start marking out um, on top of the concrete the next day. The position of the existing column was then transferred, um, what seems rather primitively, um, with string lines and lasers so that we could mark the centre line of the column and mark a 1.6 metre square piece of the B5 raft um, slab um, complete with couplers um, to receive um, the rest of the slab in the future. Um, this was poured um, this was poured with concrete um, again and um, with the column starter bars and then it became a relatively um, uh, simple construction, uh, conventional um, column construction. However, we were now operating in a 1.8 metre diameter shaft, um, pouring one floor at a time, um, installing a waffle of slab starter bars, um, a crisscross shape. Um, of slab starter bars with uh, couplers on the end, uh, bringing the column back up to, um, to sill level. Um, the column was obviously very slender um, and wasn't being restrained by the slabs at this stage, um, so there was, various, um, there was a series of uh, restraint props to um, restrain the column in this temporary condition. Um, poured the column uh, one story at a time until we uh, reached the top, um, and the sill level, at which point we removed the head trees and installed um, a pair of hydraulic flatjacks um, with a capacity of 800 tonnes and uh, constructed the column head. Um, a nominal 200 kilonewtons was put into the jacks and loaded into the column at this stage um, before we were allowed to then open up the next adjacent column. Um, there were 61 of these columns to do. Um, once we completed um, a number of the columns on three of the grid lines, we were able to um, open up a cavern. Um, firstly, we had to jack the column um, to 75% of the estimated dead load of the building, roughly about 3,000 uh, kilonewtons in each column. Um, this then enabled us to remove the temporary works we'd put in, the temporary frames, and, um, and excavate material that was in between. Um, this had several advantages. Um, we, first of all, could uh, have a party um, to, uh, to mark this milestone. Um, and also we could monitor the building um, for movements, comparing with the finite element analysis. You know, all the elements that we were doing here had been done individually, but this was the first time that they were being used in combination and, and significantly underneath um, a live hotel. Um, it, it was the first project of its kind. Um, the other um, the other advantage is it gave us space. Um, we were now operating on um, from a northern access shaft as well, but the material had to come out um, along the corridor um, through um, on a conveyor belt um, back to the Brooks Mews end um, where it was removed off site. Um, this gave us um, significant program advantages because we were working on both uh, from both sides and working on six caissons or columns um, at any one time, but the demand on logistics had increased. We had no storage on site, and the, um, the materials were brought in on a dedicated lorry coming to and from a holding yard um, and just delivered on, on, a, on a daily basis with what we needed for the day. Having that extra space in the cavern meant that we could, um, we could have at least a day's worth ahead to mitigate against any delays in getting the materials to site. Um, the columns um, all went, uh, construction and the, and the caisson excavation went, uh, went very well. 
but it relied on an awful lot of planning um, that went into the project at the beginning, and there was a lot of bespoke designs um, that, that needed to be um, manufactured in order to make it successful. Um, one being the, uh, the skip. Um, we had um, a hoist and runway beam arrangement to service the shards <coughs> for the excavation and for the building of the columns. Um, but even though the hoist was manufactured to be as small as possible and take up as the least amount of headroom, um, the dimension from the hook to the sill itself was still far too small for a, for a standard size skip um, with any decent capacity. So we designed our skips to be self uh, self-tipping um, and to fit in this limited headroom um, that, that would maximise the capacity um, and not slow the actual um, excavation down. Um, each steel ring um, was made um, in uh, three pieces plus a key piece with ladders um, pre-welded inside it. Um, these ladders, when they joined up, then gave an even run um, uh, or an even even steps uh, when they were joined together. And also they were set so they could receive the glide lock system, which was our safety system um, for allowing um, the men to um, ascend and descend the holes safely while being um, permanently attached. Uh, 26 metres is a, is a long way down. Um, the hoist was designed as a uh, true vertical lift hoist so that it wouldn't deviate um, from its centre line once it was set. However, in the first case on we did, um, we noticed that the um, steel rings themselves were not hanging plumb um, under their own weight, and there was a danger that they would catch on the um, edges of the rings as we went down. Our steel fabricator designed um, a bracket, a lifting bracket, that could be used with these so that when, the, um, when it was attached to the steel case on ring, um, it would hang plumb, perfectly plumb, and once set at the top, that was the position it would stay in all the way to the bottom. Um, similarly, with our concrete rings, whilst these were off the shelf, we sent him one of these, and again, he designed a bracket that utilises the bolt holes inside these segments, um, again, to hang the, the concrete um, segment plumb. Um, the cavern has uh, continued to be extended uh, with the completion of the 61 columns, which actually happened this week. Um, all safely and ahead of program, um, but all the um, all the works that had taken place uh, to date in terms of sealing the perimeter only actually enabled us to get down to the B1 level. There was still another 17 and a half metres to go to get down to the B5 level. The way this was achieved, um, uh, we needed to extend the underpinning um, first of all on the water cutoff beam and the um, and the existing underpinning on uh, the northeast elevation. But the way this would be achieved in terms of digging down was through a secant piled wall um, installed from the B um, the B1 level. Um, this obviously requires a piling rig, so we had our piling rig uh, modified to be electric and um, with a shorter mast to operate in five meters of headroom. Um, with a, a, a much fatter um, Kelly bar um, capable of drilling 20 metres. Um, this, um, the, the pile cages themselves have also been um, designed to be shorter, coming in in six sections and all coupled together. Um, because we, we aren't operating with the use of a tower crane, um, it is very limited um, in terms of space down there. Um, this is where we are today. Um, we have over 60% of the building now sitting on the new column construction and have started excavating um, around the columns and seen settlement of 35 millimetres um, across the entire site. But this has been uniform and well within the limits that were set um, by Arabs. Um, the monitoring itself um, of the building is through um, a liquid levelling system where a cell is placed on every column inside the building at lower ground floor um, which picks up uh, up to 0.1 millimetres of movement um, and reports back every 15 minutes through a web-based uh, monitoring system. Um, we weren't able to do any other kinds of monitoring that would require us to access these 61 columns in the building because beyond our two rooms and connecting corridor, the hotel is still operating with its banqueting kitchens, um, <coughs> laundry, um, technical services departments and various other back of house facilities, um, so it, it's just not possible. 
Um, we will continue now installing the um, contiguous piled wall um, to the site perimeter um, as we start excavating down to the B1 level. Um, and then it becomes um, a traditional top-down um, excavation um, with a moling hole um, to service the materials in and out. Um, we will start pouring the uh, concrete, uh, or bringing in the reinforcement, pouring the concrete. Everything still, remind you, all through the one window, one access shaft um, at the south of um, the building. And um, it, will con it will continue doing this until the B1 is, uh, is cast, at which point we will go down through the moling hole, um, install the B2 level, uh, B3 level, until we are down at the B5 where we get to join up all our 1.6 meter square pieces of raft that we cast from within the caissons. Um, this is not the whole, uh, the whole of the job. There is, uh, there is extensive work to, um, to uh, install two uh, lift and stair core and two service shafts that will happen from within inside the Victoria building. Um, that would need a presentation in its own um, to, uh, to detail that. Um, and um, and this is Claridge's future vision with the uh, demolition of the upper floors, um, moving the mechanical plant that that currently occupies into the basements um, and redeveloping those upper floors to give an extra 40 um, rooms and six star suites. Um, I'll leave you with some fun facts. Um, the, uh, there was over 400 meters of headings installed um, to form the network of tunnels to access the, uh, each of the, the caisson locations. Um, the, uh, the caissons themselves, the steel caissons, um, needed 654 bolts um, in each one. Over 40,000 bolts have been installed just on those. And over 5,000 cubic meters just on the caissons, not anywhere else, um, have been hand excavated by a team of 14 miners, um, mainly from Donegal. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> uh, query I have is, you mentioned that um, ground freezing was neglected yes. because of the potential damage. Yes. Uh, what is the potential damage you were concerned about? Um, because it would have had to occur um, underneath the existing raft itself, so the expansion from it would have, would have, damaged, um, would have damaged the raft in doing so. So that was eliminated. And also you, won't, you would only be able to get small sections of it at a, at a time as well. Um, so, so that was rejected. Um, so the, um, it took two weeks from start to finish um, to excavate the, the 26 to the 26 meters depth. Um, it, it varied, but um, that, was, that was more or less. And it was um, in, in a day, we were working 24 hours, um, two, two 12 hour shifts, um, which, which initially we, we, did, we did need. It was, it was very much a, a, a learning curve in terms of how much could be done and you know everybody got into into a rhythm with how it was done but the the guys then each team um would excavate um a a, a ring and a half so a meter and a half depth um of um of material a day um for the steel rings and then one concrete ring um a day um or, or a shift sorry and then the the night shift would come in and, and, and do the same so three steel rings in a 24-hour period and two concrete rings in a in a 24-hour period
Yes. Yes, um, that's, you know, the, the design, um, when I spoke about the bespoke designs, you know, it was all motivated uh, by that, the hoist in particular, which were fundamental to, to the success of the job. Um, we had a dedicated uh, man on call out who would regularly service the hoists, um, all the materials themselves, the, um, the concrete rings being off the shelf, but we knew, we knew what the weight of those were each segment, but the steel rings were designed with that in mind, but they were very lightweight, they only had a six millimeter wall. Um, the reason being they were steel versus the concrete was because we could make them the size that we, that we wanted um, and they will all be removed as part of the excavation as well. Um, but yes, every, everything, you know, it's, it's a consideration um, with everything that we were doing, building the, um, building the columns, for instance, with the reinforcement, it was all scheduled so that it was not more than three <coughs> metres and could be lowered down on the hoist with uh, lifting eyes, um, which were, uh, had, a, had a thread that could thread into the coupled uh, joint of the, of the rebar so it could be lowered down on the hoist. Um, you know, ev ev everything has, has been with that in mind. Um, now with the pile cages themselves, you know, we've got a, a 16 ton rig down there and we've managed to get some five ton machines down there, but their lifting capacity is still very small. And so we've had to, um, we've had to limit our cages again um, in terms of the length. Um, so it makes it expensive. Um, we're lucky that we have a very understanding um, client um, and I think possibly because so many people said the, the project wasn't even possible, um, that, um, that he is aware of, of some of the limitations that, that we have on site. Michelle, thanks for that. I thought it was a very impressive presentation. Um, I suppose it's a relatively risky job, I would imagine. Uh, with, with guys down confined spaces and and possible water ingress and soil and everything, how was that managed? Um, well, the fact um, once we started the caissons themselves, and um, we're in the London clay, and we're only actually excavating a meter at a time before the ring is installed and um, grouted behind to seal any um, any water that might be um, in some of the fissures of the clay. Um, so that actually isn't a problem and um, and yes it's done in an underpinning type fashion just one ring at a time and um, the guys are working down below there in in that confined space um, you know it, it is a confined space job um, but um, the atmosphere is is constantly uh, monitored um, self rescue kits um, all, the, all the usual things that you would have for for a confined space job and um, the fact that it's so much deeper um, doesn't make it any more or less risky. It's still the same, the same risks, and they're managed as, as you would expect um, for a job of that type. Okay, just just one other question. Um, just in terms of capital cost, do you have an approximate cost on the job, or, uh, or is yes. that so, um, secret? So for our part, so we um, we're, we're the design and build contractor just to produce the concrete um, concrete shell, um, and it's valued at thirty five million. Thank you. Bargain. <laughs> Yeah, I oh, just a quick question. Um, just two two quick questions actually. Uh, was archaeology an issue at all? Um, uh, no, we were um, we were in virgin ground um, from uh, immediately below the surface. Um, the the silty sand that we saw was actually we think to do with a um, the old Brooks River that used to run through there. Um, but w then we were straight into into virgin clay, so um, there was no no archaeological um, assessment. And then just uh, in terms of noise in the hotel, was there, I presume that, that there's monitors in the hotel in terms of what? Um, th it's actually not very noisy um, because we, we're we below ground. We're not actually, um, we're not actually causing any noise. You can't hear us at the south site boundary. The only time that that comes a problem is um, is when it's very sensitive. Um, the hotel has a lot of high profile um, events and movie junkets being probably one of the most sensitive where um, all the interviews for the new films um, are being recorded. And if we touch, um, if we are um, up against the raft slab itself, so when we're removing the blinding um, of the, um, 
the existing raft slab that will reverberate through the building um, and that just has to be um, coordinated so that it's not occurring when when these events are happening so we get an events schedule or, or no noise times but for the most part um, it doesn't really cause a delay to our works because once once those tunnels were installed and we were excavating below the ground um, whilst very noisy when you're stood beside it it can't, it can't be heard in the hotel or at the site boundary I uh, was just wondering, are you using self-compacting concrete throughout yes. the job and with the soil you're in, is there any requirement for the use of, say, PFA or GDBS in that? Um, no, um, there, there isn't um, on that, but we are using self-compacting um, concrete designed um, by Tarmac. Um, very high strength in the columns, it's 75 Newton. Um, 75 newton concrete um, and um, and all self-compacting. Um, I don't know whether you picked up on the picture, but once the once the waffle slabs go in um, for the for the slab starter bars, it's very very congested. Um, again, we wouldn't be able to vibrate the concrete, and um, and so it all has to be self-compacting. Okay, I think I'll wrap it up there. Thanks very much. Okay, it was, uh, thank you. Okay, we're just running a, a little bit ahead of schedule, but uh, we'll just have a, a break now, um, and there should be, I, I'd said, about a quarter past 11 for a coffee outside, so hopefully there's coffee out there. Um, we've got two sessions after the coffee break uh, to do with the refurb of the Irish courthouses, so uh, if I could ask you to be back for 11.30? or 11.30 would be great. Okay, thanks a lot.
sure the video is still working. This is we this is we have done it.
Okay, so this is the only one we have to fix. No, the whole other one. Yeah, but the only presentation. Yeah.
with the um Thanks very much for coming back on time, much appreciated. And um, we're gonna start uh, our final two slots now, which are um, gonna be run back to back actually. So we'll hold questions at the end of the, uh, after these two slots. Um, so the Courthouse Refurbishments one is gonna be undertaken by John Bailey, who's a chartered engineer, with Malone O'Regan Consulting Engineers. Um, uh, John is a chartered engineer and project manager with over 30 years of uh, experience delivering, delivering industrial, commercial, building, civil engineering, transportation and infrastructure projects. Everything. <laughs> His main interests are the technical and manager managerial leadership of engineering projects. John. Good morning. Um, we've just been looking at some fairly high tech, very modern engineering. So n now we're gonna step back. Instead of looking at concrete with 75 Newton strengths, we've been dealing with materials that might have a one Newton compressive strength if we're lucky. A um, couple of caveats at the start of this. There are very large design teams on this. So anything that you think might be good on this, it's down to the team. If there are any glaring errors, they're mine. Um, now this presentation was developed about a month ago. And I noticed yesterday running through it, there were a couple of slides towards the end that use the past tense. And actually that work is ongoing as we speak. So there should be present tense rather than past. What I intend to do is, is look at the course bundle as a whole. 
Now, quartz bundle one is a bundle of seven quartz that was let as a PPP. Uh, the end user is the Irish Quartz Service and it's procured by the NDFA. Uh, Malona Regan's client is BAM Builders and uh, BAM PPP is the PPP vehicle. The courthouse was involved, Cork, Limerick, Letterkenny, Wexford, Waterford, Drogheda and Mullingar. Now five of those seven courts have conservation aspects in, in them. Malona Regan are responsible for civil and structural design on five of those <coughs> courts, Letterkenny, Wexford, Mullingar, Drogheda and Waterford. I think I'd left one out. So there's a fairly wide geographical spread. Cork and Limerick were designed by Maliki Walsh and partners. Um, now, the most significant conservation works were in Mullingar, and that's the building I intend to uh, concentrate on, although I'll take Waterford and Wexford first. Um, on the slide there in front of you, the top building is a model of Letterkenny Courthouse, which is completely new build. Um, that courthouse is due to hand back in possibly the next few days. Uh, the centre one is Waterford Courthouse. Um, sorry. You can see at the back there is a very large modern building. The front portion here has the original courthouses to either side and the front portico and entrance hall are about 200 years old. The, the bottom picture is Mullingar Courthouse. The old part of that dates from 1828 and we are putting very modern extensions around three sides of that building. Wexford Courthouse, and I am going to skim very quickly on these. Uh, you'll see there a very modern building to the back, uh, a less modern building to the front, which is 100, 120 years old. What was done to that, the roof was taken off the timber carcassing on the roof is, was in pretty good condition. It was retained. New sarking felt on. The original slates were put back. The barges are, are around the edges are new. The whole building was repointed. The windows were taken out, refurbished, put back in. On the right-hand side, that corner, as you look at it, there was a little bit of differential settlement, and that corner was stitched back into the building. Otherwise, all we did was assess the timber floors for the proposed loading. Uh, first floor suspended was okay. Ground floor, floor needed a little bit of work. Sorry. I've shot myself in the foot. I put up this slide just to show what happens. This is sort of unforeseen stuff from site. You'll see there's brown staining in bands along the front. Now, what this is, that at some time in the past, the brickwork was actually cleaned and the hard face has been taken off the brick. There was a scaffold in front of that and those marks were in the shadow of the scaffold boards water wasn't getting out of the, the brickwork quick enough and we got a little bit of staining from uh, lichen growing in those locations. Now that has since disappeared since the walls are properly ventilated. Some of the flues at the top, these are chimneys. The left hand side is a chimney towards the back of the building. Structural growies at the top. You can see from the, the picture on the right it's leaning quite badly. That chimney, two of the chimneys at the back were taken down, completely rebuilt, and new flashing soakers and all the good stuff put in as they went. And the roof timbers, which had the roof had originally taken support from the chimneys, so the, the roof was trimmed around. So some very local resupport structurally. Waterford Courthouse, a little bit older, verging on 200 years. Again, you can see a very grand portico. There were two court courtrooms originally left and right. Um, we put new structure within those, so there are now two courtrooms on either side of the entrance hall, and there is a very large 
in situ concrete structural building coming right up to it at the back. Everything in this project, by the way, was worked through Revit and modeled in 3D. So this mo uh, graphic you see here came very early on. It actually comes out of one of the bid documents. But you can see very clearly, or I hope you can, we have large courtroom here, large courtroom here, entrance portico. There was a 1980s intrusion here, which we removed, and then a very large modern extension to the rear, coming right up, almost touching. This is a section through the back wall. I'm not too sure how clear it is. What you're seeing there, the rear wall of the building comes down. It's sitting on rock. Our new basement comes down and comes down a metre and a half, two metres below the existing foundation level. So that rock has been stabilised with a couple of rock anchors in there. It's shielded. In order to build the basement, we have some temporary support here, which has taken the lateral load from the sill behind the wall, and then that basement went in. As I said, we have courtrooms within the original courtrooms. We're also approaching within 10, 12 mil at the back of the building. All the modern work is isolated from the original work uh, with movement joints. There is one location in the entrance hall. There is a modern gallery. Now that, that gallery is actually supported from modern structure um, behind the existing wall. What we did was we punched holes locally through the walls uh, put steel beams in, which are supported on the, the new concrete structure behind, and put a light crinkly tin deck in here. So the modern work, although it seems to knit and integrate completely with, with the original, it's actually completely separate. At roof level, the roofs have been pretty well remodeled just to introduce light at the high levels. So there are large... Um, skylights introduced into the roofs. There was a certain amount of extra bracing involved because there was an intervention in the 1980s. The OPW put in concrete ring beams, which we had an issue with. Um, so lots of extra bracing at high level. Just a few extra bits and pieces behind the portico. You can see there the brickwork is not the most robust and not something we'd expect to be building these days but it's been left there, it's been stitched in, and it's good for several years to come. Uh, perhaps I should say, uh, I, I should have said earlier, one of the contract requirements on this is that the PPP company maintains the buildings for 25 years, and that at handback stage, tw in 25 years' time, the buildings have to have a, a residual life of 50 years on all major structural elements. So that means that our design life from now is 75 years, and that's beyond what we would normally be designing to using Euro codes or British standards. And that has a knock-on effect in most areas. This is Mullingar Courthouse. Judging by the car, that was probably shot in late 40s, early 50s. Um, when it was built, there was two large courtrooms left and right of the entrance portico and then administration behind those. Um, it's been hacked around over the years. This is what we are producing. The original building is left pretty well intact, but we have a very large extension on the southern elevation, which you can see on that slide. It actually wraps right around the building and around the north end as well. Um, as I sa said previously, we're coming up right up to within 10, 12 mil of the original buildings, but not actually touching them in most. Um, the existing courthouse, <coughs> built 1824, finished probably about 1828. Now, it had a few pre-existing conditions. It was largely intact, but feeling its age. So we had delamination in walls, 
no bonding of wall junctions, little bit of differential settlement, damp rising and coming down from the roof, timber decay, vegetation growing on the roof, all the good stuff. We also had previous in interventions. Um, there was a concrete document store. Mullingar Court is, I believe, a probate court and stores probate wills and doc such documents for the whole area. Because of that, there's a document store which is completely isolated for fire purposes. So in the 1980s, there has been concrete floors introduced into one of the rooms to provide a fireproof box at high level. Uh, there was also a new floor at some stage put over what was the left-hand courtroom, as you saw on the, the previous slide, um, and offices introduced over that court. Now, that happened sometime post-62 because they were British standard sections, um, but we're not quite sure when. There were also new ceilings over the courts. The main feature, stair, um, is old, we know, but it may not be original. There is some evidence to suggest it was introduced after the main build and possibly mo remodeling of some of the courtrooms, just judging by the scarring that we saw when we removed uh, the finishes. We put in new offices and custody, er er custody areas built around three sides. Um, as you saw, the modern extension is glass and stone. We also remodeled and refurbished the existing building. We provided additional plant space, offices and meeting rooms at second floor level. Now, second floor level was the attic space and that's important later on. We also provided plant space, storage and office and custody areas at basement level. So we extended the building, the existing building upwards and downwards. We also put in two major intrusions where the new building intrudes into the, the existing one towards the back for a public reception area, and one at the south end, so the courtrooms were turned through 90 degrees and made bigger. As I said, the 75 year design life made my life quite difficult for some time. Now this was all done with a conservation philosophy. And as I said, we've, we've moved in from the last talk to this from very high strength materials to very delicate materials. So the philosophy can be summarized as follows, that we do as little as possible to the or for original fabric. Um, repair options were always given priority over replacement. And where we did need to replace, it was replaced with something as close as possible to the original. Now, modern interventions, when we needed to put them in, are shown as modern. We don't try to hide them or turn them into pastiche. Um, in this building, this is probably most noticeable where we're putting new door ropes into existing walls. So we were putting in steel heads. A lot of the time we exposed those heads, just <coughs> painted them with intumescent, and depending where they are, they may have had to be hidden with, with fireboard, but there was no attempt to make them look old or make them look part of the original. As far as practical, inappropriate interventions were removed and original details were restored. And as far as practically ecologically sound materials and methods were used, as I said, inappropriate modern interventions uh, were treated appropriately. And I use that phrase um, deliberately. Some of the modern interve interventions, this is a shot looking straight up under the existing feature stairs. This steel framework was put in probably in the early 1980s by the OPW. Now, it's dog rough. It was slightly better when we took over the building first in that it was hidden behind a bit of fireboard. Um, our conservation architect had quite a lot to say about this, none of it good. Engineering-wise, we'd have quite a lot to say about it, and again, not much of it good. But in fairness to it, it did the job at the time. Temporary supports were also required to a lot of this. And by the way, I'm, on, I'm quite conscious these slides are very dense in text. That's going to unravel fairly quickly, I think, as we move into photos. 
but then the photos get a bit dense and I'm going to have to walk you through them. The temporary supports generally builder led and agreed with the builder before the structural alterations were, were undertaken. All openings in the existing building were suitably braced, walls tied together at junctions and walls were consolidated using lime mortar and grout. The basic premise was to keep the building dry. Um, it was not exposed to the elements unnecessarily and quite a lot of time and effort on site was dedicated to that. Um, where possible, we put in the new structure before the old structure was removed or altered and permanent connections made so that that new structure actually provided whatever temporary support we needed. Uh, most of the temporary supports were designed by a different group within Malone O'Regan of chartered engineers, but what it meant was that the temporary works guy and the permanent works were working within one or two desks of each other. So we each knew how the structural forms were meant to work and could work around that. And there was quite a bit to be gained with that understanding. The photo you're <coughs> seeing here, um, there was a chimney to be removed very early on. And actually, all of this structure was removed at a later date, but it, in order to keep water out of the building, we took down the walls, left the roof there, and left external walls um, to keep the building secure. So we a couple of steel beams in there just to hold the roof in place. Some examples of other ones. This is just temporary supports to the roof because that wall was had to be removed. The top meter or so had to be rebuilt. Those trusses were left in place while that was going on. Um, the slates have been removed from, from the top side, so there's actually very little weight on that. This is towards the back of the building. This is in here. This is the intrusion, the intrusion on the eastern side of the building. You can see on the exposed walls, these have all been lined. They're pretty well waterproof. There's a flying shore here. There's a, a raker shore. That shore was never actually tightened up. They were precautionary as much as actually working uh, props. We had an issue with progressive collapse. As I said earlier, the, buildings were the building essentially was two and a half stories when we started. We were turning that into a four story building, usable space. Now, that means that all the derogations in the building regs don't apply. We have to apply building regs to this, the particularly the progressive collapse, as if it were a new building. Um, this is quite tricky to do on an old building. We ended up doing a risk assessment, um, putting in mitigation measures, and then advising residu residual risk. This is pretty well the same process that you would use for a stadium or any other building with uh, large numbers of the public involved. This in graphical form is what EN 1991-7 says. It, it's how it breaks, des describes buildings in terms of progressive collapse. It's the number of floors, it's the floor area, and it's whether or not the public has access to it. Now, we suspect when it was written, this whole column was expected to be uh, consequent class 2A. Actually, it, gets, it moves from 2A to 3, between two and three stories, and that puts us right in in the middle of consequence class three, and it means doing a full risk assessment on the building. The graphic on the left there was what we got when we did the examined the risks first. Now the main risks in there are basically explosion risks and vehicle impact. When we do our mitigation measures, Everything moves down and left, which is good. The ones that are left, deliberately expl placed explosions, we can do nothing about that. All we can do is put a note in the safety file, listen lads, you need to have a bit of security here, but it is a court building, so that kind of goes with the territory. Vehicle impacts, 
are a little bit more subtle. Now, they can either be accidental or they can be deliberate. And other members of the design team had a lot to say about that. At the time, they thought we were perhaps a little bit over the top until I started using the hands. Um, then people got a bit quieter. Practically, what that meant is that we defined the vehicle movement zones around the building. And in one or two key places where we thought there was a, a possibility of an impact doing real damage, we protected that area with bollards and a bit of landscaping so that nothing can get near the building in those areas. The mitigation measures, there was structural tying involved. Now, a lot of that structural tying we would have done on any building anyway, uh, or at least a building of this age. Along with that, service locations, we took all gas out of the, the existing building. So all of that, the boilers are located within the new build. We also have a transformer, it is in the new build. All voids are ventilated. We have gas barriers. Um, they would have gone in for radon anyway. We have explosion relief panels to the layman there called windows. Um, there are a couple of areas of structure where we've reinforced. Um, we've provided protected members. And as I said, we've defined the vehicle routes. And we've said that security is a good idea during construction and operation. Now, tying the building together. This building was built in 1825, and it's showing its age. All the Euronorms say, really, is that blockwork or masonry walls should be tied together. It says nothing after that. It doesn't tell you how it should be done. It doesn't tell you what those ties sh should be able to resist. So we went back to IS-325, um, part one, and we used the guidance there as, as that standard was more appropriate. Now, it would suggest horizontal pr um, peripheral ties should have been put in, but we didn't put them in, and the reason we didn't put them in is that those ties are designed to act with the walls above them to form composite uh, beams if the structure beneath is, is removed. Now, given the nature of the construction, it's highly unlikely that a horizontal tie would act in, in, that, in, in, in that way, and actually it may well serve to transmit damage to other parts of the building. So we tied the floors together to use the diaphragm action. We tied corners together, but we didn't provide the lateral tie that you might expect on a modern building because we thought it would do more damage than good. These were the, the kind of details that we produced at bid stage. And they're a little bit rough, but what they say, lads, is look, there'll be a stainless steel strap around the corners, there'll be bolted corners. And there's one area where we have a frame. We can't define an alternative load path for this. This will be a protected uh, member. This is what it means in practice. Um, as I said, the standard doesn't give any guidance, so we went elsewhere, back to 325. It suggests a tie force per tie of about 8.1 kilonewtons. Now, on, as you can see on that photograph, there's a hell of a lot of bolting going on there. And in most materials, that would give you an awful lot more. But we're going into an unknown material. We're going into something that doesn't have an ETAG or any sort of guarantee with it. So we did our own testing on the bolting. We installed 16 bolts all around the building um, before we did it. This happened at a very early stage, but we're still doing our clear out, as you can see. Um, and then we do pull-out tests on those. This is the original jack we used. We had a bit of a problem. We broke the jack. <laughs> so we got a bigger one. <laughs> and those fixings were failing somewhere between 20 and 40 kilonewtons. 
and as you can see from the, the right hand photo the plaster is still on the walls so we don't know whether we're going into header court with our stringers at that point so that gives a pretty good representation of what the, the underlying material is going to give us in terms of bolting when you work back those results you actually get a design load per bolt of only about 3.6 kilonewtons and that's why on the previous slide there were a huge number of bolts we also did some fairly minor tying this is uh, a heli bar tie across a crack now the heli bar tie it's a, a three mil stainless wire with a helical thread formed on it give it a bit of bite and that is basically introduced across the, the crack in a bed joint and it's grouted in with an epoxy repair mortar. It's one of the only places where we were allowed to use epoxy mortar or any modern material in the building. Now, having said that, these, and, and what I said previously about the bolting, the strength you can generate in these is tiny. So it's more like putting a ferry strip on a cut. You're not gonna stitch anything together if it wants to move those, those ties won't actually complete it or hold it. We have two very large intrusions into the building. The east one, that dimension there is around about seven metres and we had one to the south here. This was an old courtroom. The court was turned through 90 degrees so we took out a nine metre length of the original wall and we introduced two stories of courtroom uh, spanning into that uh, void. This is what it, it looks like in terms of, of what we're doing. We have steel frames immediately adjacent to the original work. Steel frame are coming in onto them and concrete decks cantilevering out to movement joints all around. On the south, same philosophy is applied, gets a little bit more complicated. We did take some structural support um, from the original building. We did make sure when we did that, that uh, the floor slabs can move in both directions horizontally. So all we're doing is taking vertical support. And this is what they look like in the raw. This here is the east cut being, having been done, flying shore, waterproofing in place to keep the building secure. And this is it taking at an, taken at an angle. So our basement is progressing, waterproof membranes are in place, rebar is, is ready for this first pour uh, which went in there. And this picture here is the south elevation, I'm told that's video isn't working but it is here so you're looking at our protected structure here a new floor at roof level we have two beams here originally we had designed this with a view to leaving about a meter and a half of the original wall in place now when we came to site it looked quite impractical. So that wall was taken out, and we'll come back to that again. A couple of steel beams put in. There is a third beam, which you may be able to see there, which is actually on the other side of the movement joint. So we have two independent structures coming up very close to each other. We also had a downward extension. Uh, this is the north end of the building you can see here this is the intrusion at the east there was a basement from this line to your right from this line left we went down one story um, so we have plant room and tanks in this area we have new access here a uh, bit of filing and administration along here from a conservation point of view, we also ended up taking out this volume here. And the reason for that is that this space 
is usable space. We want to achieve a bit of ventilation on this side of the wall as well, so that we can guarantee that the basement areas remain dry. This photograph here, I was standing at about that location, looking left to right. So I'm about three metres below the original back corridor. Looking along, you can see here there's a culvert, which was the original drainage for the whole street. That culvert was di diverted away from the building. It had done a little bit of damage over the years and um, in terms of some of the adjacent walls. I beg your pardon. This shows what we're doing in the basement. This is under the left-hand court. You can see here, we have a series of pad stones put into the, the existing wall. And those pad stones are there because we weren't sure we could achieve the strengths we needed by bolting directly to the wall. So we can achieve much better uh, strength in the fixings by bolting into in concrete that we know is not going to crack. So those pad stones were introduced. Um, we had a bit of discussion with the conservation people about putting them in, but they are reversible. There is actually an isolation membrane between them and the original fabric. So in theory, they could come out at some time in the future. We have a new lift shaft, which is similarly isolated from the existing structure. We did have to nibble away at a basement wall. So this wall has been consolidated from both sides uh, before that structure went in. So if I play this on a bit. When we come round to this side, you get a closer look at the, the angles and the bolting. So basically we've got a, a big concrete blob here with bolts going in and you can just see there's a bit of black jock leaking down the wall because the inside of that hole was painted with bitumen in order to provide a debonding agent. We had the previous modern intervention, interventions. I spoke about a concrete box which was two stories up. There was a fear that this concrete box, the stiffening effect of the concrete box inside an otherwise uh, very flexible structure might do damage. Now, it was our intention originally to take this out and put new floors in. But when we looked at it, when we came to do it, we looked first at the crack pattern on the outside of the building. Now this was the south eastern corner. So we compared crack patterns on the southeastern corner and the northeastern corner, which were the elevation was, was symmetrical and the crack patterns were pretty well symmetrical as well. So there was nothing really in that crack pattern to suggest that this room on one end was doing anything different to the building. Now we had informal talks with the, the authority at the time, and they said, no, we're not convinced. We need a lot more information on this. We went in, we developed internal elevations all around that corner. Now, they didn't show us anything that would suggest that there was any stiffening effect whatsoever from this concrete. They did, however, show us that there was a lot more delamination in the external walls than we had realized because the patterns inside and out didn't match. So we did quite a lot of t additional tying around the outside to make sure that the outer leaf and the inner leaves are actually tied together. In terms of the floor itself, these turned out to be 150 wide precast planks, probably Holocaust, with a concrete screed on top. And with a good deal of negotiation, um, and looking at what the conservation people actually were afraid of, and it was the stiffening effect rather than any philosophical thing about concrete, we said, okay, we can actually take away that stiffening effect. And we basically saw the, the, the screed. We cut the screed, 
So they're acting now as discrete planks, not connected together. They're not a diaphragm. There's a new timber floor, which does not take support from this, about a foot over this. But it was left in place. And the reason it was left in place was because it would take a couple of weeks and an awful lot of temporary works to take it out with a huge risk to the building. We thought the risk, there was no benefit from imposing that risk on the building. We had previous repairs. This is a shot from the north roof. It doesn't really matter where it is. What had happened was there, the, the slopes of the roof roofs were not planes. So somebody had gone in, probably in the 80s, they had added rafters alongside the existing rafters in order to provide flat planes. And then they'd uh, retile the roof. They actually addressed the wrong problem. When we went and looked at the rafters, the rafters were perfectly strong enough. They had probably been subject to a bit of creep because they'd been distorted for a long time and therefore there were nice gentle curves on the roof. The real problem was the timber trusses supporting the rafters and the purlins. So part of our works was we took off the repair because the repair was untreated timber and would have been quite a sizable risk to our client given the long time they're going to be responsible for the building. Um, we did local repairs as well. You can see there's been qu quite a bit of water in there. Anywhere we've had uh, rot, worm, all the good stuff you normally get. We've basically taken out the affected timber and spliced on. I don't think there were any replacement timbers in that roof, apart from local splicing. The general strategy in terms of repairs and strengthening is to eliminate the causes of problems, repair where possible, and replace as a last resort. And these photos show some of the typical things we had. On the front facade, the mortar has been washed out of the joints. There's been a little bit of settlement over the years, causing some of the cracks in some of the stonework. We have growies here. This one wasn't too bad. Some of them you could have probably describe as structural. Around the three other faces where we have uh, rubble masonry, it had been or repointed rather in sand cement at some stage. All of that was taken off and repointed. This is, as I said, some of the photos are getting a bit congested. Within the roof, truss ends, some of them were a little bit dodgy. The woodworm had been feeding in there for 200 years. Wall plates taken out and removed. Rafters spliced as necessary. Um, when I say the wall plates were removed, they were only re re removed where they were rotten or where the woodworm had had a good go at them. Any sound timber was left. Um, before we started any of this, the timber was inspected by an expert and graded, so we knew what we were dealing with. These trusses are not acting as trusses. We measured everything, we put them into our, our computers. The computer said no, so we did a little bit of work on them. A little bit agricultural in that respect, but we'll come to that. This is work on the west facade, which is the front of the building, and on the south. This detail here is actually this photograph here, but it's handed. I'm sorry, I don't actually have a photograph from the other end, so I could put directly comparable um, photo and detail beside each other. What's happening here, you can see that the trusses have been supported temporarily. Everything is stripped from the roof. A small band about a metre and a half deep has been taken off. The, the original wall has been taken down and this is take, being taken down in the permanent situation. Um, so we're taking down to put in beams to build back up. And the guys working on this side, they're actually standing on the permanent structure on the new build. So we have two beams under the existing, a third one side by side, 
which is supported off new structure rather than the existing. On the front facade, we took down a number of, of, it, of meters of it to about where our new floor joists are going in. We had a number of different situations there. A lot of it was just tying the facade back into the existing. And that's using an awful lot of heli bar. Something slightly heavier to support the, the, the floor coming in. This one here, there is a cartouche on the front which had been leaning. That cartouche we had removed very early on. We put it back and dowed it into the existing stonework. So that is now structurally stable. And eventually there will be a flagstone, flagpole going back on that. The, the trusses which we've seen earlier, because they were in such a bad state structurally, we ended up putting new structure alongside them. So the original structure is still there. It's still visible in probably most cases. Um, the only there is connections between the new and old, but the connections all they are are bolt holes which go through the neutral axis of the members. So we've done little or no damage to the existing fabric of the building, but we have provided a structure that will hold up our roof properly. Timber floors, as I said previously, we lapped on, we replaced damaged timbers, we didn't take out anything sound. These beams generally, as I said, were, were earlier additions to the building. Um, they are BS sections, so they're post-1962, probably early 70s. We put a couple of beams alongside them just to break up um, timber spans because uh, there's an office level going on immediately above them. This floor here was in pretty good condition. We did end up adding to that floor. There are fairly chunky uh, 300 mil deep joists in that location. But because of the long span, there was a, a vibration issue rather than a, a strength issue. So we've added joists, we've added um, blocking, we've put plywood on top. We've done everything we can to stiffen that floor. But we've added to, we've not taken out or replaced. This is our roof. I'm going to step on one because we have a vi this is video. So you have fairly agricultural steel sections beside the existing. This space now is a plant room. All of these spaces are filled with tin boxes. The original timbers are all left in situ. Now, because it's become a, a plant room, the slope of the roof you're seeing is the, the surface that's presented to the public. This is a rear slope. So we're actually putting a flat roof over that, but leaving the existing timber purlins in place. And these purlins are also augmented by a uh, steel channel. I suppose one of the main selling points when we started this first was the feature stairs. This graphic here uh, comes from the bid. This is a, a stone stand cantilever stairs. It's probably about 170 years old. It's in pretty rough condition now. If you look at the pictures, these pictures were taken probably three years ago. There's a fall across the tread of about 50 millimeters. There's 15 to 20 mil wear on the nosings. Uh, this photograph here is actually, from the photographer was standing on the half landing looking up. The top one is on the top landing looking down. The steel structure I showed very early on was here and running down this. So this stone stairs is not acting as it had intended. And previous attempts to support it um, had failed. As I said, 50 mil dip on the treads. The lower flight is actually supported on a brick partition, which is this photo here in the middle. You can see you can get a tape between the treads. Now in a cantilever stairs, there should be a pretty intimate uh, 
connection between the treads. So a 20 mil gap there is disastrous. If that stairs weren't supported um, by the partition, by the, the steel structure, it would undoubtedly collapse. Now, in order to approach this, there are reasonably specialised items. We started off doing a liter literature review. We also spoke to other engineers. There are probably two or three firms in this country that have done quite a lot of work on that and they're reasonably open with their information up to a point. We did a physical examination and then we did a few hard sums on them. This is the, the underside of the bearings. If we look at this, you can probably see that the brick immediately under the bearing, it isn't the same brick stock as in the rest of the wall. Um, also, when we get down here and along here, there are slips of slate worked in as wedges. And that would suggest to us that this stairs may probably wasn't built as part of the original. It wasn't put in at the same time as the walls. It was almost certainly put in later. Um, there is other uh, evidence for that. We developed a repair strategy, and essentially what it says is, we'll temporarily support the stairs. We have to do that. We'll re-level and re-support the, the treads, the springing points, and the landings. One of the main po uh, reasons for the failure was that the springing points and the, and the landings had actually moved. The walls supporting them were subs had subsided. There were a number of damaged threads which were putting back, and we rebed all the threads and wedged them in tight, and we're using stainless steel wedges uh, for that and cut bricks. Now, what you're looking at here is a prototype stairs. This piece of structure is very, very delicate. We said we'll put it back, we'll put it into a usable condition. But there's really no plan B if it goes wrong. So we said we'd, do a, we'd build a prototype. What we did was we built 12 treads into an adjoining wall in one of the courthouses. The treads you're looking at are actually mass concrete. There's no reinforcement at all in them. There are actually three Portland stone treads which are a pretty good match for the original material at the bottom of this flight. Um, so these three flights here are Portland stone. You can see when you go to introduce them into the wall, we've, we've taken out anything loose above and we're going to rebuild that. So they're properly bedded and wedged. We're actually using high strength brick immediately adjacent to the treads where they bear into the wall. The reason for that is that when you do the, the calculations on the bearings, you get local overstress immediately above and below the treads. So we're putting in stronger materials in those locations. When we did this, I'm not sure you can see it, but in each of the bed joints here, they were originally built with lime mortar. Now, lime mortar is very, very weak, and it takes a long time to go off. So you may get the equivalent of a modern M1 strength, but you're going to get it at 90 days, not at 28. Um, so a bit difficult. We ended up putting stainless steel nails into the bed joints to pack those joints. So there's a solid connection brick to brick in order to distribute stress away from the bearings. And when we knew we'd made it, we tested it. There are six and a half tons of steel on that with no supports underneath. Um, the reason for the prototype, firstly to confirm that an, our analysis was right, and then to confirm that uh, the construction details we intended to use can actually be achieved in practice and to make sure the sequence 
if, if uh, feasible. We also were looking for improvements on the method, and we did introduce a couple of changes after the prototype. And I suppose the great thing about it was it allowed us to make any mistakes early. If we were going to create a pile of rubble out of the stairs, I'd much prefer to do it with this one rather than the 200-year-old version. As I said, we tested it up to 25% over the design load. So design load on a stairs in a public area is four kilonewtons. We put five onto it. Um, this is one of the deflection curves. Things to look for is good bounce back after each load cycle. The yellow curve was done two to three days after the first. So the materials were that much better bedded in. So you can see a little bit of work hardening, but the slope of that graph is a good deal shallower. All of those things gave us a lot of confidence in the prototype. And this is it. You can see here three Portland treads into the wall, mass concrete above it. On a cantilever stairs, the most heavily stressed treads are the top one and the lowest one. So given that the most of the load is coming directly down the flight, we put the stone treads where they're going to get most uh, most stress. The outcome from the test. The prototype easily resisted the test load. Displacements were linear with good recovery, some were cartoning. We learned a number of lessons from it. This, the treads are rebated, and the purpose of the rebates is to transmit load from tread to tread down the stair. Now, we had put those rebates in, we had applied a very thin layer of mortar bedding into those rebates. When we do it on the real job, they're not going in. Um, lime mortar tends to creep. So all supports and rebates must be packed tight. They need steel shims. They do not need mortar bedding. Uh, bed joints, similarly, fully packed and wedged. Any lime in those joints is going to be cosmetic. It's going to be pointing only. Having learned those lessons, we've developed our method statement for doing the work on the original. Now, this is when I said that this was written about a month ago. And we thought we would have the stairs constructed and tested. Now, that work is due to happen possibly as early as next week, but it's not complete. Um, before we do that work, the prototype is still there. So we're going to ask the stonemasons, do it on the prototype first. Take the treads all out of the wall, remake the wall, then put the treads back in. Prove to us that you can do it. More importantly, they'll have to prove to themselves they can do it. It generates a bit of confidence in the workmen. Um, they've had a bit of practice before they go doing the surgery. So we've, we've made the amendments, as I said, to the method statements. Conservation architect and the client are pretty well bought in on them. And when that stairs is rebuilt, we will rebuild or we will retest the original stair up to five kilo newtons as well. And the reason for that is that most cantilever stairs, if they're going to fail, they will either fail due to creep because of lime and all the good stuff in the wall, or else there'll be a failure in the treads, and that'll be a sudden failure. Now, we would like a sudden failure to happen under controlled circumstances before we hand the building back. So we're going to load test the original once we've repaired it. As I said, we, we're extending upwards. This photograph is, is going to be a meeting room. So the, tre the roof trusses, which you've seen earlier, we have a fairly agricultural structural support system alongside them. They're all being hidden in that location within a partition wall. But as we say there, the original roof structure is there in place and everything else is reversible. We went down. Uh, 
you've seen this video already, but in order to make that space underneath, we also had to go down outside because this wall wasn't originally retaining. We didn't want to turn it into a retaining wall. So we've lowered the ground level externally and we will be leaving it quite low with a suspended slab outside. And that does two things. It keeps the stress off the wall, but it also means that that wall can be ventilated from both sides. So it should remain dry. In the basement, the original basement was terribly, terribly crowded. And you can, you can see on this photograph here, the corridors were very narrow. We did have to open out some of those corridors into adjacent rooms in order to make usable space. <coughs> now, when the basement were for formed, the ground floor was Probably not originally, well certainly not originally, but when we got the building there was a concrete slab there, floating slab. It was floating on fill which is sitting on our brick arches. Those brick arches are less than 200 mil thick, they're quite delicate, but they are staying. We had to take out some of the, the walls supporting those arches and this is essentially what we did. If we start on the left-hand side, the arches were exposed from above and the fill taken out. Into that space, we dropped a fairly chunky piece of steel. Th um, we then go down below and we do an underpinning operation. We take out a, a length of wall to be removed perhaps 700 mil long. The plates you see in this picture, they are 600 mil in length by probably 1200, maybe 1500 wide. Those plates are put, slotted into that hole and then bolted up and tightened to the underside of the steel beam. So essentially, these arches are now hanging from that steel. And what that gives us is an area where the springing of the arch and the arches remain. We have 2.1 meters clear just about underneath the arches. And that's enough for usable space just about. But over the majority of the floor because of the arch effect, obviously the headroom is much higher. We provide the class three basements throughout. Um, bone dry. That's what we were told. How we did that, we have pretty standard building details, radon barrier with concrete above it. There's a product called BTEC, which is a, a waterproof uh, cement render um, applied to the face of the wall. Our, our waterproof barrier is brought up and sealed onto that. Above that, the original uh, plan was electroosmotic PPCs, which were to be introduced at the top of the BTEC, which is basically the finished floor level. We have gone away from electroosmosis, and the walls have been injected with a liquid PPC. Um, more from practicality and long-term effectiveness. Then on each side of this wall, it's plastered with lime mortar. So if any moisture does get up from there, it can uh, escape into the atmosphere without damaging the building. We use BIM throughout this project. The entire project is done in Revit. Everything from ridge tiles down to, dr and including drainage, is done in 3D. Uh, using project websites for transfer of information. The real advantage in Revit is coordination. Designs are coordinated at a very early stage. Um, we have used point cloud surveys to do, as, to do as constructed work. We then bring them back into the, the models 
and adjust the models where they need to be, to be adjusted. So there may be very small adjustments required because of that. The Revit can handle very intricate details. Um, and one of the main advantages is clash detection early. It highlights the cul-de-sacs at design stage before they become issues on the site, or at least that's the theory. Like any PPP, um, there's an awful lot of paperwork involved. We had all the standard stuff, and I'm not going to go into it here, but we also use structural reports, which are not part of the standard process, um, but they went a very long way to get client buy-in much earlier than playing email tennis. What would typically happen was we would put information in for approval, the authority would come back with perhaps 50 questions um, and say, can you explain all this? So we'd write a report on it and that report would go in. We would sub subsequently meet the authority and go through it face to face. Now these reports, bec because of the nature of the building and, and we're opening up stuff for, and seeing stuff for the first time as we take plaster off, they're all live documents, and some of those probably go to about 10 versions at the moment uh, before we get to, to actually build something. But what it does do is it brings in the client technical people and gets them involved in the process and gets them part of the discussion so that they're, they're not on the sideline throwing stones. They become part of the discussion and they actually become an informal part of the design team. Now, we've done it on, I've listed all, uh, quite a lot of them there. I think we have one outstanding at the moment. Um, but that informal process, we find it works a good deal better than the formal, formal submission process within the PPP process. People involved, quite a lot of us, End user is the Irish Court Service, procured by the NDSA. Our client, BAM Builders, BAM PPP. The architects on Mullingar, CCH, are the Hickey. Our conservation architect is Michael O'Boyle of Lewis O'Donoghue. ME consultant, Homan O'Brien, Malone O'Egan, Civil Structural. The builders are BAM Builders. Mercury Engineering, Dara Byrne, Erwin Carr on Sound. Or Hurley Access and Plaguestone as specialist stonemasons. On the client side, Noon and Mulligan Architects, Michael Grace as conservation architect. Um, the two Michaels have a very large input into everything we do in terms of design <coughs> and structural work. And RPS groups from East Canada out of Galway is the structural, civil and structural technical advisor, and the OPW are on the m &E side. Now that's that, and if I'm lucky, I'll just have um, one more thing to show, if I can get to it. not sure how this is going to, ah, it is working. Let me take it back to the start. This is a time lapse done on the, the load test. So there are three guys moving six and a half tons of steel onto that stairs and getting quite hot doing it. That's what a load test looks like. They actually ran out of steel weights. You'll have seen there were concrete blocks on the end. We had to get more. This was actually, if you like, a rehearsal for the test because when we did the prototype load test, uh, we had the authority there to, to witness it. I didn't want it to fail, so we did our own rehearsal pre before it. Yeah. 
the, there was the original temporary support which wedged up the treads as they were installed and in order to do the test we simply removed the wedges so that it was free floating but it could drop maybe 20 mil max and we were very careful about making sure we loaded from the bottom up and then removed from the same way so we were very unlikely to have somebody on the stairs if it did fail now that's really all I have to say so if you have questions I'd be delighted Thank you. Um, you said that you went away from electroosmosis for the damp proofing to, uh, is it some kind of injection system? Yes. Exactly why was that? Is you said something about over the longevity of the building that wasn't suitable? I, no, that didn't come from engineering. It came right. from the builder and the architects. There's nothing wrong with electroosmosis. I think they felt that putting something there that didn't require any maintenance or any any attention over the, the lifespan that uh, they would, would maintain the building would be a benefit. So that was the only reason that I'm aware of that that the change was made. Okay. And was there any damp proofing applied to the masonry above ground? Uh, products applied to the external masonry? was redone. As I said, a lot of the building was, was covered in sand cement uh, pointing, which was done probably in the 80s. That was all removed and uh, line pointing w was put back, which is more compatible with the building type. Okay. So that sort of work was done. A lot of work was done to repair the, the ashlar stonework on the front facade and that was all repointed as well. But Formal waterproofing, no. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Um, and, and thank you, John. Uh, I'm sure it's quite difficult to condense four, five courthouses into a short presentation and give a flavour. Uh, perhaps maybe you could uh, give us a few more words on the aspect of um, having a 200 year old building comply with modern codes of practice and the difficulties that that threw up and I suppose some of the sidestepping I know you've touched on it but um, I'm aware that there's a lot of time and effort went into that aspect of it yeah terribly difficult um, and not only because to make it comply with building regs, but there's a contractual obligation there to provide a 75 year design life. And this threw up a couple of interesting issues. For instance, window oaks in the external wall, if they're existing oaks, they have timber lintels on them. Now, there's no way in the world we can say that a timber lintel is gonna survive 75 years in an external wall. So we went back to the, the authority and said, listen, lads, you're going to get 10 years if you're looking for an agreement search on this. Um, good conservation practices say we replace like with like, but there are no guarantees on that. And they said, yes, OK, to that. And what we did in that situation, we had two trusses on the southern elevation, which we weren't go going to use. They were going to be removed. So they actually got chopped up and the timber was reused within the building as timber lintels. Having said that, any new oaks in the external walls are new structure, and we can't create new or greater contraventions of the, of the regulations, so we ended up putting stainless steel lintels over them. And there were only, I think, two of them. But there is very much a, a juxtaposition 
and you need to be very aware of it. John, this is a second, you added a second floor to the building. Yes. Was the cantilever stairs going to go to the second floor as well? Sorry, no. The, the proposal is that we will put a new feature stairs above the existing, but that new feature stairs has to complement the character of the building, but architecturally to read as different, new and modern. So we're hanging the steel stairs from the roof and cladding it in stone. But it is going to be a very, very modern looking stairs. So it will read completely differently from the, the original cantilever stairs. Thank you. We could take one more question if there is one. From a property loss prevention, a fire property loss prevention, uh, what measures were taken or were there any taken in other words, to prevent a serious property damage? The, the building has to comply with modern building codes. Therefore, we have all the, the good stuff, means of escape, um, that sort of when it comes down to, to detail, um, I suppose the one that comes to mind most is doors. We did upgrade the existing doors as much as possible, but that's another instance where we've had to go to the authority and say, look, we can do X, Y, and Z to the doors. We believe that they will provide the fire rating that's required, but we will not have a single document um, like an agreement, sir, for that process. And essentially, their fire experts and our fire, fire experts had to agree that that uh, strategy was acceptable. Okay. Okay, uh, thanks very much. Um, just, just before we wrap up, I suppose I just want to do a little bit of advertising. Uh, we have our next lecture is uh, November the fifteenth, and it, it centres around uh, the original trams in Dublin. So I suppose it's timely before the Lewis Cross City opens up. So, uh, and then we're also going to have our next half day lecture series will be uh, March two thousand and eighteen. So it'll probably be four lectures again and two based on buildings and buildings and two probably on civil structures um, so we're always looking for topics so if anyone's got any topics that they'd like to volunteer uh, just let myself and Emmett know but uh, yeah I suppose I just want to officially close uh, the proceedings today and I just want to thank our speakers uh, Kieran, Michelle and uh, John uh, it takes an awful lot of effort to put these things together and uh, obviously from the quality of the presentations there was an awful lot of effort put into each of them um, and uh, we'd just like uh, you to show your appreciation in the usual manner. Thank you.